All right. Thanks so much. I appreciate being invited. Uh, when I got an email from Mark, he, he asked, you could tell that he was walking on eggshells because of the nature of the topic. Of course, I had responded that I, there was no problem whatsoever in terms of me speaking on the issue. Someone's got to lose, and in our system, uh, in our uh, federal and provincial system, several people have to lo lose. So I, I, there was no shame in uh, me coming to talk on this issue. Uh, the second thing is that I apologize for not being here earlier, and that was an advantage, uh, I think, to losing because my position as uh, dad taxi has been reinstated. So I spent a good part of my day driving my kids around to their various events, uh, which is something I perhaps would not have been privileged to do had I won the election. Um, the other thing I wrote uh, down here as a joke uh, brought to you by Alex Godbold and the federal NDP, because I think that's an important distinction to make in uh, relation to federal, provincial, and municipal politics, and I'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, at the federal and provincial levels, we, of course, uh, in the NDP's case, at any rate, didn't lose alone the entire party loss. So th there are some things to take into consideration there when it, you um, need to think about how you're going to cope with the loss that you have just um, uh, undergone, that you've just experienced. Um, I thought to get started I would just put out a series of questions that I'll try my best to answer in the next half hour or so and please if you want to interrupt at any time feel free to do so. I'm not sure that I have a full half hour of, uh, in, of material up here. And the other thing that I wanted to, um, to mention was that well, as I was preparing this I realized that I was putting up a lot of photos of myself and I thought I, the last thing I want to do is come across as egocentric. but this really was my loss and I think what I'm presenting to you is the way in which that I dealt with it personally and people of course would deal with this in different ways but I, I hope that my personal experience will translate to what uh, hopefully will not be a universal experience that some of you in the room are going to have to lose uh, and I'm hoping that what I have to say about it perhaps w will be useful to you uh, in the horrible event that you do lose. Um, what I want to start with though was uh, who was I before I, decided to get, before, I decided, before I decided to get involved in politics? Um, the first thing I want to talk about are my personal interests. And politics are a personal interest, but I felt it was important to make a distinction there because I think it'll be obvious that A is the silver lining to how you deal with loss. You are given your life back. And I will be somewhat partisan during the presentation. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to be ironic and thank Stephen Harper for a 77-day campaign because at the end of that campaign, all I wanted was for it to end. I didn't care what the outcome was. I just wanted it to end. I wanted my life back. Whether or not that was going to be as a, your future MP or going back to the classroom, I just wanted the thing to be finished. It was ridiculously long, and I hope that our current Prime Minister has the sense to go back to the classic 33-day election campaign in everyone's interest. I'm sure you were all sick of it too. Uh, being on the front line was, was terrible, <laughs> close to the end. I, have no, I, I say it was terrible, I want to take that back because one of my series of slides is actually about how much fun we did have, and that is sincere, we had a blast. Um, but I want to talk about uh, my level of political engagement because one of the most difficult things about losing is still happening right now. And I'll get into that a little bit later and I'll explain why. Um, yeah, so B, the, my, my political engagement and my relation to politics has changed. And that change on the surface, you would think it would be a positive thing. But I want to show you that it, in fact, is quite difficult uh, and hard to, uh, to deal with. I thought I would just put up some pictures. Who am I? Who was I? Uh, October of 2014, I finished my first marathon in Moncton. It was a very, personally, it was one of my proudest moments. A lot of people who do a marathon will tell you, bucket list, we'll never do it again. My runner's high lasted months. I couldn't wait for the next one. So that's something about me that is important. It's a passion of mine, and it takes up a lot of time. <laughs> so when you're out there uh, running uh, hundreds of kilometers uh, in a month, that takes up a lot of your time. So you can't uh, wallow in self-pity because you're busy running. Uh, these are pictures of my boys. They have become uh, accomplished musicians. Um, and I have been a part of that since the loss of the election. Their guitar skills have increased phenomenally and I have been there to witness it. Uh, I play a little bit myself, but they have both surpassed me in skill. Uh, my older boy, Mathieu, will still ask me, Dad, can you, and I'll say, no, you can show me now. I have no idea. 
who've gone way beyond me in terms of guitar skills. This is my younger boy, Felix, who loves singing. Um, he has stolen about three songs that are usually in my repertoire at the family parties, so I have lost those. Uh, he does a lot of French songs that I used to do from my Quebecois and Franco-Ontarian heritage. Uh, and of course, that has been positive and fantastic for me to be able to see uh, my kids uh, develop as uh, growing into young men. Matsu will be 15 on Monday. Felix will be 12 in the summer. So I've been able to continue to spend time with them. Uh, and there was a huge interruption there during the 77-day campaign um, where I didn't get to spend as much time as I would have liked to. But these were the choices that we had made. Uh, my wife, Alison Smith, in the corner is a, a poet. She is working on her fourth book and she very generously took a pause in editing that manuscript to work on my campaign. Uh, she worked extremely hard. That's a picture of her at her last reading at Lexicon Books in Lunenburg, a reading which I was able to attend. Uh, and I probably would not have been able to do so uh, had I won the election. I just thought I'd put up a picture of the book I'm reading right now because I can read that book right now. And it's a novel and it is not about NDP policy. It's just a great book, <laughs> and I'm thoroughly enjoying it. And this is where I teach, La Sid, which is the Francophone Acadian School here uh, in Bridgewater. And I always did love my job, and I continue to love it. And in some respects, I think that I bring a new uh, confidence to what I do professionally now, uh, one that uh, perhaps uh, might not have been there before, simply because of the fact that I have what I feel are leadership skills that I've gained through my experience uh, as a political candidate. And I should say, as cheesy and cliche as this is going to sound, I believe it's really true. If, even if you're just contemplating going into the, to, to politics at any level, you've won. I know it sounds cliche, but it's true. And you're going to find that out from all kinds of people because two things are going to happen. Three things, I should say. You're going to have your sort of indifferent person who's going to be polite to you at the door you're going to have another kind of person who's going to curse you, literally, and tell you that you're only in it because you're lining your pockets and all the politicians are corrupt. It's a nonpartisan attack, but it's an attack nonetheless. Uh, then you're going to have people who are going to thank you, regardless of the party that you've decided to run for. And those are the people that recognize that you are already a winner because they, they might say, I would never do that. You're so brave to have done so. So you'll get, in that regard, I think that as cheesy as cliche as it sounds, you, you've won, you know, but by deciding to step up and getting involved in what can become a very dirty business, uh, I think that you and I, we should be proud of the fact that we've done that. And I think that there's a lot to be said uh, in terms of win-lose just in that respect. I meant to open with those words, but I forgot. <clears throat> Maintain a sense of humor. This is uh, Facebook. Uh, post that my wife had written about, well, here we go, on April 18th. She wrote, so much work to do after ignoring the garden in 2015. Upside, a rest has probably done the soil good. I pat myself on the back for covering most of the beds with leaves. So I decided to write, need any help? And I posted a picture of Tom saying, I'm ready, which was one of our uh, campaign slogans. <laughs> so I think self-deprecation, whether it's directed towards you or your party, uh, is pretty important. Maybe not so much during the campaign itself, uh, <laughs> but a little afterwards, uh, I think that it, uh, it can help you stay sane. Um, and this is something that uh, we uh, try and do. In fact, today my, sist my, my, uh, my wife, Allison, again had posted an insight into, just getting back to what uh, was talked about earlier about women in politics, um, Sophie recently has been criticized for some uh, comments that she made about how difficult it is for her to be um, in the position that she's in. And in a conversation that my wife had, she said, really, like, it's, so, it's so sexist that Sophie Trudeau is the wife of the prime minister when she has such an important role. And in our 2016 electoral system, you'd think that perhaps that role could be changed somewhat so that, I don't know, could it become a paid position, uh, uh, an ambassador, an official role other than the wife of the Prime Minister, because it's, uh, it's, it's undoubtedly true that her life is committed to politics now. Um, anyway, this was just a, a conversation we we're having off the top of our heads in the, uh, in the kitchen. So Allison had posted, I think it was just today, uh, a comment on 
the Sophie Trudeau um, debate, perhaps, that's been going on. And I went onto YouTube to see if I could find the sound of crickets chirping. And I copied and pasted it. <laughs> and I'll explain what that means in a second uh, when I get to the more difficult part of losing. Um, but again, this, this idea of maintaining a sense of humor uh, back and forth. And I'll, I'll tell you what that cricket chirping means in a minute. I see a typo there. Um, so I gave you a picture of who I was, the types of things that uh, have always kept me sane and that perhaps I have, uh, th that I value even more because I have the time to value them. I have always been politically engaged and aware I have always identified myself as a social democrat, but I was never a political junkie. And what I mean by that is I was not a huge newspaper reader of the politics section. I wasn't up to date with every policy decision made by whoever the governing party was. I guess you could say that I had a very secure sense of what my political philosophy was, and that political philosophy informed my view of the world. Because I would say that I was not a political junkie, I wouldn't want you to mistake that for being misinformed. Uh, I just sought my information else, elsewhere. I've, I've always, I am an English and French uh, literature major, so my view of the world has been informed by literature, by writing, by philosophy. Not that I ever read the newspaper, but to say that I was a political junkie would be false. Um, I, my brother-in-law, my uh, sister's husband, who's a, a, a conservative, would probably fit this description, but he also fits this description as well. He would never miss power in politics. Uh, he reads the Toronto Star every day and is very informed of what's going on up to the minute. That wasn't me prior to this election. Um, I was not in the least bit interested in becoming a political candidate. It's not, it was not a lifelong ambition for me. I never ever saw myself as someone who could do this. Um, so I guess the burning question is, why on earth would I have done it? This is a picture of me and my friend Don Calhoun. Don is a relentless NDPer. He is, he has, I think it would be fair to say, dedicated his life to the NDP. He lives in Bridgewater. He was the first person to call me and to say, why don't you consider running for the NDP? And of course I laughed. I thought it was completely ridiculous. It was not something that I ever imagined myself doing. But it's interesting, and this could be true for some of you in the room, when someone plants that seed, you just can't shake it. So on these runs that I uh, would be out on, I, I would just think, I would imagine, God, may, may, maybe I could do this. Maybe that could be me. Uh, that combined with, uh, and again, if I could be partisan for a minute, uh, my loathing for the Harper Conservatives, uh, and if there's any Conservatives in the room, I apologize, but then again, I don't, because I really feel that the darkest moment, the darkest 10 years that we experienced as Canadians was under the Harper Conservatives. Um, heck, I'm not, uh, I don't have to be careful, I'm not a candidate anymore. They were terrible years, uh, and I really felt guilty in a way for not having done more in 2011. So I knew that in 2015, I was gonna do more. I was gonna be knocking on doors that we needed to do something to get rid of Stephen Harper and his uh, cronies because I feel that Canada suffered immensely uh, under their, uh, I hesitate to use the word leadership, but there it is. And something needed to change and I, my wife Allison and I said that we would not wake up on the morning of October 20th telling ourselves, oh, we should have done more. Did I imagine that I would go from that to becoming the candidate? No, but that was what eventually happened after I spoke to friends, family, and colleagues. Um, this, I think I would have to identify as my role model. Uh, Megan Leslie, to me, it was perhaps is a politician that represented authenticity to me. I felt that the cynicism that a lot of us have in relation to politicians that I had, still have sometimes, did not relate, did not apply 
to Megan Leslie. There was something about her that I felt was real. When I heard her on the radio, I was completely uh, inspired. And I really felt that maybe if she can do it, if she can somehow be a politician and still maintain authenticity and integrity, well, then maybe I could do it too. Not to say that I saw myself as the next Megan Leslie. I'm not that egocentric. But I certainly was inspired by her. And if she, I don't know that I would have done it, to be honest, if uh, Megan Leslie were, um, were, was not one of our elected uh, representatives at that time. But I really, really felt and still feel that there was something about her that you could distinguish her from most politicians. So that was a huge inspiration for me. And this is a picture of her after I uh, um, successfully um, won the nomination. Uh, just a little over a year ago. And for me, of course, it would have to be the NDP if I was to get involved in federal or provincial politics. I've been a member on and off, and I say off out of laziness because sometimes my membership lapsed, and Don would remind me of that fact. Um, but that's the, it, this is the only party I feel that I, that I could have uh, run for uh, at the uh, federal level at any rate. And the provincial level, I'm just, I'm not considering doing that. Um, how to lose. Run a campaign you can be proud of. We had so much fun, despite the exhaustion and despite the fact that it was so long. And one thing that I'm, um, that I'm really proud of was the extent to which we involved uh, music. And, and uh, we, we made music a huge part of the campaign, uh, where I always had my guitar with me after this event. I was with Denise uh, in... Oh, I forget the name of the community. It'll come to me later. And it was a summer picnic they were having, and there were some musicians that were informally jamming. They were called, oh, I've forgotten all the, the, the names. If it comes to me, I'll share it again. But they basically were sharing a microphone. Uh, it was like a jam session. And Denise had said, oh, it's too bad you don't have your guitar. And coincidentally, I happened to have it. So I went to get it, and I joined the circle. And I, I had been singing, I sang a Bob Dylan song, which had become the campaign song unofficially. And uh, I sang a Johnny Cash song, Folsom Prison Blues, and everyone was clapping and they were really into it and they thought it was a lot of fun. So after that, Denise looked at me and she said, whatever you do during this campaign, you make sure that guitar is always in the car. Because it really drew people in uh, and it gave people an idea, I think, of who I was on a personal level. So it was something that I, I, I took the advice. Um, this was a proud moment. One of my folk heroes, Old Man Ludica, uh, another one of my folk heroes, uh, Laura, Laura Smith, uh, decided to come to a fundraising event. Uh, and they played. Uh, in fact, I can now say that Old Man Ludica and Laura Smith opened for me because I sang last. <laughs> uh, so it was, it was a great event. And here we had a, an event uh, down around here on the South Shore. That's Desi Gordon and her partner, Stefan. Uh, and they played for me. And this is my son uh, playing at a fundraising dinner. Maybe, I think he's playing one of those songs that he stole from my repertoire. So I think that that would be some advice as well. And uh, the, I forget his name, but the president of the Lunenburg uh, South Shore, sorry, the, the president of the Liberal Writing Association federally, um, I re introduced himself to me at the, the pub in Mohon Bay. And that was his advice. It was very friendly advice. Uh, and he said that, w you know, whatever you do, just make sure you have fun with it. And we did. We had a blast. And I just thought I would sh share a few other pictures. Um, the parades, I don't know how many parades. I felt like a deadhead who just went to all the different parades across South Shore St. Margaret's. Uh, we were very proud of what we did. We made sure that we could get as, the, as many people walking with us in terms of uh, representation of age. So we had kids on skateboards handing out candy. Uh, and this was at the end of the Liverpool parade. This was the Green Party candidate, Richard Bigger. I don't know if you know, he, he walked the riding. He walked the whole riding, which is huge. So he started basically in Halifax, and over a series of days, he walked all the way down to uh, Barrington Passage, where the, the, the riding ends. And he, <laughs> he had identified Bernadette and I as the progressives, so he, he, the progressive candidate. So he sent an invitation, and he said, come and walk with me just for a little bit. So I walked with him from... Uh, uh, we left Liverpool, and I think I walked as far as, as the White Point exit or a bit further. And then I went out uh, canvassing somewhere else. And uh, Richard's become a friend since then. And it was a, sort of another proud, fun moment where uh, we were able to sort of reach out across 
uh, party lines and be somewhat nonpartisan for uh, the sort of couple of hours that we walked together. And, uh, you know, it was a transformative experience in a lot of ways, and I think that this is true uh, for anyone who gets involved. Um, I just thought I'd take a picture of some of the other candidates and some of the sort of uh, NDP bigwigs. Uh, there, there's uh, Peter, uh, there's Tom right here. This was when uh, he was in, uh, I can't remember if that was Peter or Robert's riding, but it was somewhere around Dartmouth. Uh, and we had met with uh, a bunch of um, veterans at a legion and th that was uh, a, a fun time. And there's Robert up there and Joanne who, uh, who ran in Halifax West. Over here, there was a rally when Tom was in town and they had asked uh, Joanne and I to introduce him. I think they, they wanted a symbolic, you know, the young blood kind of uh, a moment. So we had a, a great time there being, having the opportunity to speak uh, before uh, Tom came uh, to speak to the people of, in Halifax. And Peter uh, had some interesting things to say. This was canvassing in Lunenburg. And even though he <laughs> still uh, he admits to being shocked at his loss, I think a lot of us were shocked at the fact that he and Megan uh, lost their seats. But one of the things that Peter Stoffer said over lunch was, if your name's on the ballot, you can win. And what he was referring to was people basically telling him that he was a shoe in you, know, you don't have to, what are you doing all this work for? He's, uh, Peter Stoffer I, I had the reputation of being one of the hardest working MPs. So he, he was constantly campaigning, canvassing, even though he was, by all accounts, a quote-unquote shoe-in. But of course, you know that that wasn't true. But Peter had, had said that if your name's on the ballot, you could win, and you have to work from that assumption. It doesn't matter what the polls say. It doesn't matter how many uh, years you've been uh, in power, and the fact that you're an incumbent means nothing. You have to campaign as though you're going to lose. And interesting because, in fact, he did. You know, uh, he, so he, his his insight was was correct. Okay, challenges of the loss. So this is the cricket chirping comment. This is I am now more politically aware than I ever was. I would say that sounds egocentric. I don't mean it that way, but I'm more involved and I'm more in tune and I am that political junkie now. So not only am I a social democrat who has a general outlook philosophically and politically on the world, I'm now a junkie. We got rid of television with the whole Netflix thing and now I'm kind of wondering if we should get it back. Why? Because I want to watch Power and Politics. So I, I, I am now engaged at that level, whereas I didn't used to be. It's a blessing and a curse. How is it a bad thing to be more politically involved, aware and engaged? Well, when you're the loser, <laughs> it's hard to know where to direct your criticism, right? You ask yourself if your opinions are objective, right? You wonder yourself, I don't think I'm a sore loser, but I might give off that impression if I criticize the liberals. Oh, he's just mad because he lost, right? So these are the types of questions you ask yourself. And this is the other one. This is what I struggle with the most. Does anyone care and where is the outrage? And I'll be, I'll be partisan here for a minute. A lot of the work that the true liberals have done, fantastic, and it's quite different, I think everyone would agree, from the Harper Conservatives. But a lot of the stuff that's going on is what I would call neoliberal, just as neoliberal as a Harper Conservative policy. For example, the TPP, uh, the pipelines, uh, the lack of I'm getting, I'm, I think I'm campaigning again here. I'll, I'll stop after this last comment. The lack of, uh, of targets for climate change. Well, I had such a fantastic social media experience during the campaign where I was engaged, engaging, talking to people all the time. Now, if you criticize something that you know would have been a Harper policy, now you put something up on Facebook and you think, that was an awesome post. Really articulate, to the point, that was clear. This is where you hear the crickets chirp. No one cares. <laughs> we got rid of Harper, right? Politics have ended. Who cares? No one cares. And you can hear, the, I even, yes, I even put in, ah, oh, it's not there. I put in, a, I put in that YouTube clip of cr crickets chirping, <laughs> right? And, th th and this is what is difficult as the losing candidate. 
you have that, that, that engagement is instinctive. You want to get on and you want to share your opinions and you want to say, I'm aware, but it's delicate, right? So the, some of the things, I, I, there, there you go. These, those top three things, that's, that's got Harper Conservatives written all over it. Um, electoral reform, I put on a, qu a question mark because there seem to be some advancements, some advances, sorry, but I feel that it's, uh, that the, that the table stacked, but anyway. And of course, people are starting to make fun of the Trudeau selfies. So my, my, my wife, who's also uh, an English uh, literature major, said that under the Harper Conservatives, we had 1984. No question, right? Under the Trudeau Liberals, it's Brave New World. Everyone's eating their Soma, <laughs> and they're just loving it, right? But below the surface, there are some things going on that I think deserve uh, to be talked about and criticized. So. How do I deal with this as the losing candidate? Well, I have decided that social media perhaps isn't the best place, or at the very least, I need to accept that I'm not going to get the engagement that I did during a campaign. First of all, because it's not a campaign. Maybe we shouldn't be expecting our Canadian citizens to be as engaged and involved as they were during a campaign, because now they're just getting on with their lives, right? So I can save it for 2019 and hope for... Uh, more interaction then. Um, the other thing is to stay, in fall, stay involved differently. I, uh, and, and also savor the victories. I'm still involved with the NDP. I played a very small role in getting Gary Burrell elected uh, as our leader. This was at his celebration party. And you can see we're having a good time and we're very happy. So rather than waste my time on Facebook uh, critic <laughs> criticizing, <laughs> excuse me, the federal liberals and the provincial liberals while, while I'm on the topic. Uh, I, I, you need to stay involved, you know, and, and, and like it or not, uh, I became a public figure um, and I still am. Uh, I was invited to speak here today. People still talk to me in the grocery store. I did a half marathon in Liverpool last weekend and the, a woman came up to me and she said, I knew I recognized you. you, I voted for you. So, and you get those those little moments of pride as well. Uh, even though you lost, you know, geez, 10,000 people did vote for me. So uh, those are things um, to be happy about. And I think I'll, I, I need to wrap it up. So the last few, th I guess I did take a whole half hour. The last few things um, that distinguishes my experience from what yours uh, will be should you lose is that I can direct my criticism towards either the symbolic le leader, the, the leader who's the symbol of the party, so in this case, uh, Justin Trudeau, the party itself, right? I can, I can uh, direct my, my criticism and my new sort of political activism and awareness towards my own party. I get very upset with the contempt that my fellow NDPers have for the Leap Manifesto. That is, that's me. I, I, for one of the reasons I got involved in politics was because of environmentalism and my envir environmental co uh, convictions. And the fact that the NDP simply wants to talk about looking at the Leap Manifesto has made a lot of people upset within my own party. So these are conversations that I can, that I can have with my own NDPers in a recognized political party. More difficult at the municipal level, you know, when you, you should you lose, will perhaps uh, have that same level of uh, awareness and engagement and you'll want to take it somewhere, uh, but it'd be very difficult. Uh, I, I would never go on my Facebook account and criticize uh, Bernadette. I, I think it would just be rude. <laughs> I, I wouldn't dream of doing it. Trudeau, no problem, right? Uh, but it, it's not something that I would ever uh, dream of doing. And so at the municipal level, uh, when you lose to a person and not a political party, uh, that would be, I think, difficult, particularly if you were seeing things that you didn't agree with and that you feel that you could have done differently. Um, the new leadership race again, I, I didn't like uh, the, um, the fact that the party decided to get rid of Tom. I th think it was a mistake. Uh, and that's a conversation that I can have with other NDPers. Uh, at the municipal level, it's something that I think will be even, would be even more challenging to uh, not have that, uh, you can't blame a party, <laughs> your own or another one, I guess, is what's, uh, what's difficult. And the only thing I could come up with there is, of course, uh, you want to make sure that you focus on policy and not the person. If, if there's a person who's elected, 
instead of you and that that person is uh, making decisions that uh, you don't agree with, then it's, it's the decision and the policy, I think, that you want to be able to focus on rather than the person. So, sorry, I've taken five minutes more than I should have. That's my spiel on uh, losing a federal election and uh, what you could learn from it. Thank you. Thank you.